Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Lewis McGlynn. Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Saoirse Healy. Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Donald C. Stewart. Broadcasting Scotland is Scotland's independent broadcaster, providing factual news, reporting on the issues important to the people of Scotland. We are committed to public service broadcasting and with your support we will produce even more programmes. We provide opportunities for young people interested in media production and broadcasting and challenge preconceptions of what Scottish media looks like, amplifying Scotland's voice and reflecting its communities. We can already deliver high quality live news and we will create the highest quality programmes for you to enjoy but we can only do that with your support. So please subscribe to and share our channel or donate to Broadcasting Scotland via the link in the description. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. The first item of business is general questions and at question number one I call Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it's taking to support rural health boards. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. It's uh, for health boards to plan and provide services to best meet the needs of local people, including those in remote and rural areas, consistent with national policies and frameworks. As someone who grew up uh, in a rural island community, I recognise that remote and rural NHS boards experience particular challenges, which is why work is ongoing to support the delivery of services that are flexible and responsive to local population needs and geographic challenges. An example is the National Centre for Remote and Rural Healthcare, uh, which was launched last October. And in terms of overall resources, the Scottish Government's budget for this year provides funding of over £19.5 billion for NHS recovery, health and social care, including over £14.2 billion investment for NHS boards, delivering a real terms uplift of almost 3% compared uh, to uh, UK Government continued austerity. Oliver Mundell. Um, I thank the Minister uh, for that answer and steering away from the political debate around sort of specific budgets, uh, I'm concerned that the current funding model doesn't take into account uh, the ageing demographic in areas like uh, Dumfries and Galloway and the challenges around uh, delivering health, ser health services across a wide geography. Um, and I wondered in light of the recent uh, work on rural depopulation, uh, if uh, the Cabinet Secretary would undertake to look again uh, at whether or not current funding formulas are, are truly uh, accounting for the need, particularly uh, of ageing people in rural communities. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, I hope wherever it is that uh, Oliver Mundell is steering to, he does, to, uh, does so uh, safely. Um, but uh, 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 going back to the question uh, in hand, I uh, obviously recognise, as I set out in my initial answer, uh, the fact that uh, the remote rural island communities have particular demographic challenges. So I will always look and take representation from uh, Oliver Mundell, uh, other colleagues who represent rural areas, uh, and indeed uh, those uh, in our boards around uh, how we can support them in the delivery of those services. I've already uh, referenced uh, in my initial answer the work that's been done for the National Centre for Remote and Rural uh, Health and Care, uh, and uh, hope that the work that they continue to, to do will help to inform the decisions that we need to make in this area. But uh, as much as uh, Oliver Mundell would wish uh, not to talk about the budgetary situation, the, the financial landscape is incredibly pressing uh, and uh, we, we need to be cognizant of that as we take our decisions. Rhoda Grant. The Western Isles Health Board is offering record salaries for GPs to relocate to the islands because of staff shortages. 
Will the Scottish Government now reassess rural and island recruitment incentives in order to attract staff because of the cost of employing locums is excessive? And given that one of the reasons for the difficulty is the inability to find a home, will they also take steps to address the housing crisis in these areas by placing a ceiling on the number of holiday homes and second homes that can be sustained by a community and placing a burden on homes subsidised by the public purse in order to keep them within the local housing market? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, colleagues across government will absolutely note uh, Rhoda Grant's calls there on the housing front uh, and uh, her call to further crack down on, uh, on holiday lets. Um, and I know in terms of the Rural Housing Action Plan that my colleague Paul McLennan has taken forward that there is action being taken in order to provide greater supply in those areas because I recognise that that is uh, one of the uh, issues that is facing uh, recruitment, not just for the health and social care services but across uh, the public uh, sector uh, in ensuring that we can attract people to live and work in these areas uh, and it's something that I'll continue to work with colleagues across government upon. There's much interest in this session, of course, and concise questions and responses would be appreciated. Question number two, I call Sandesh Gulhani. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has intervened to direct NHS Fife and the relevant education authorities to permit schools to issue basic medications such as paracetamol and ibuprofen without the need for a GP prescription in light of reports that primary care is struggling in NHS Fife. Minister Jenny Minto. The Scottish Government has not directed NHS Fife or Fife Council to give permission to schools to issue basic medications such as paracetamol or ibuprofen. Our guidance on supporting children and young people with healthcare needs in schools states that schools should not purchase non-prescribed medication unless they are using powers permitted under the provision of the Human Medicines Regulations. These regulations permit schools to buy and hold subutamol inhalers to treat asthma or adrenaline auto-injectors to treat anaphylaxis. Parents may provide schools with non-prescribed medications alongside clear and appropriate instructions for their use, as well as consent for the medication to be administered. Alternatively, pupils or parents or, and, or carers on their behalf can access the NHS Pharmacy First Scotland service provided by community pharmacies to receive advice and medicines to treat minor illnesses and common clinical conditions. Sandish Gohani. I declare my register of interest as a practising NHS GP and someone who has recently worked in NHS Fife, which has proved to be far more challenging than it needed to be. I was unable to order blood tests that I can in other health boards and I couldn't organise radiological investigations. It was an absolute nightmare. But none of that compares to the disgrace that was the rejection of referrals from GPs to the hospital. Speaking to other GPs across the health board, it's clear there's an underlying presumption of rejection of referrals, presumably to improve figures. And I was told it depends upon the day and the mood of the consultant whether a GP referral would be rejected or not. So, Forcing GPs to waste their time issuing prescriptions for basic medications because schools insist upon it, and please just help sort this, and wasting time fighting the system to get your patient seen and treated is unacceptable. Will, will the Minister call out this postcode lottery and undertake an investigation into the practices of NHS Fife? Minister. Um, that was uh, quite, quite a question. Um, with regards to, um, and uh, also something that um, we, we take note of and um, will look at, we have regular meetings with NHS Fife um, and ha have discussions on these things. But with regards to um, prescriptions to, to schools, I have laid out that community pharmacies are the places for uh, families to go to, and I've uh, laid out in my first response that. Willie Rennie. Uh, North East Fife Health Centres have not been given the members of the multidisciplinary team that they were promised. Local GPs have, uh, however, offered to solve the problem by recruiting themselves, but the previous Health Secretary said that would lead to different services in different parts of the country. But does the Minister accept that people in North East Fife are already facing different outcomes? And will she allow GPs to recruit these staff themselves? Minister. 
I thank Willie Rennie um, for his question. And I know that we've been working um, with GPs in Fife to ensure we get the right um, volume of staff there. Um, I'm happy to look into um, his proposals with regard to allowing GPs to specifically appoint um, people within their practices and get back to him. Question number three, Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce the number of assaults by pupils in schools. Cabinet Secretary Jenny Gilruth. I am absolutely clear that our schools should be safe and consistent learning environments for all. No teacher, support assistant or pupil should face violence in Scotland's schools. The behaviour in Scottish schools research published in November providing the robust and accurate national picture in relation to behaviour in Scotland schools and the series of behaviour summits I held in September, October and November alongside the findings from the BISA research are informing the National Action Plan. In my statement to Parliament last year I confirmed that that multi-year joint action plan would be developed to tackle instances of challenging behaviour working with local authorities, trade unions and others. The plan will publish in spring. This week, the First Minister and I also launched the Gender-Based Violence Framework, which aims to address the issues of misogyny and gender-based violence in schools, a theme captured by the BISA research. Maurice Golden. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. But I was recently contacted by a constituent in Angus who told me how her son required hospital treatment after being assaulted by a fellow pupil. Unfortunately, my constituent has been dismayed at the school's response. The head teacher has twice declined to meet with her personally. A proposed safety plan was full of holes and, incredibly, it was suggested her son be removed from his peers and educated separately whilst requests to exclude the alleged attacker were rebuffed. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe this family are receiving the support they need? And what will the member do to ensure they get that support? Cabinet Secretary. I thank Mr Golden for, for raising his constituents' query and obviously he's outlined some of the detail in relation to that case in the Chamber today. If he's able to share more detail with my office, I will speak to officials regarding the specifics. Of course, it would be in this instance a matter for the local authority to engage with that parent and to engage, of course, with the head teacher. Although he has outlined a challenging instance today, and I think it is worth reflecting that that is also captured by the BISA research, which published last year. So I'm happy to engage with the member to the specifics of his ask today. Short supplementary, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. Um, Cabinet Secretary, poverty and child hunger is an area we know has a key impact on children's behaviour at school. Can I ask you what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that no child goes to school in Scotland hungry? Cabinet Secretary. We have the most comprehensive free school meal offer in any nation in the UK and we are currently extending this offer to cover primary six and seven children in receipt of the Scottish child payment from February 2025 as the next step in universal expansion in our primary schools. Thank you. Question number four, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government when it last met the EIS and other teacher unions to discuss school-based violence. Cabinet Secretary. I meet with our national teaching unions regularly to discuss a range of topics, uh, including violence, and I met with the EIS and other teaching unions last Monday. I chaired a meeting of the Scottish Advisory Group on Relationships and Behaviour in Schools on the 31st of January to discuss the National Behaviour Action Plan which was attended by the main teaching unions, including the EIS. I held a roundtable with the EIS and other teaching unions on the, 12th, uh, on the 6th rather, of December to discuss their reflections on the national behaviour in Scottish schools research and their own views on actions required within the Relationships and Behaviour Action Plan. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for that response, and she will no doubt have heard from those unions about the disappointment that they felt that the Scottish Government were so desperately unaware of the EIS Aberdeen report on violence, where 800 teachers had responded. But to that point, there is a national plan coming forward. But can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that teacher well-being will be added as a quality indicator in school inspections, given the impact of violence on our teachers? Cabinet Secretary. I thank the member for his question and of course the localised evidence that he speaks to is hugely important in informing that national action plan and that will say a range of actions for the government to respond to but also for local authorities and I think it's important that that is understood and I continue to engage of course with the EIS at national level with Andrea Bradley but with the other teaching unions 
a number of whom have also published uh, documentary evidence in relation to the extent of challenging behaviour in our schools. The member asked a very specific point in relation to a quality indicator in school inspections. Of course, I think that would be a matter for the newly appointed interim chief inspector, but I'm more than happy to speak to the chief inspector about that process and including that in future school inspections for her consideration. Brief supplementary, Liam Kerr. Grateful. Following the shocking EIS report on violence in Aberdeen, Aberdeen City Council is introducing a whistleblowing form for teachers who feel that they're discouraged from reporting violent incidents by pupils. Does the Cabinet Secretary welcome this move or does she have concerns? Cabinet Secretary. I, have, uh, I don't think I would have concerns. I think it's an appropriate move from that local authority to respond to challenges in their area. There are other local authorities, as I understand it, that use similar protocol in relation to incidents of this nature, and we will certainly seek to engage with Aberdeen City Council, as I have already done so, on their approach to challenging behaviour. Question number five, Ben McPherson. To ask the Scottish Government how it is taking forward the work and priorities of its Ministerial Population Task Force. Minister Emma Roddick. The population strategy sets out the task force priorities around the opportunities and challenges for Scotland's changing population. We are committed to a collaborative approach to delivering these ambitions, including along with COSLA and local authorities through our recurring population roundtable with membership from Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and South of Scotland Enterprise on the Population Programme Board, which supports the task force. Our Addressing Depopulation Action Plan, published in February, states our commitment to working with regional, local and community partners to deliver a sustainable solution to population challenges. We will also launch our Talent Attraction and Migration Service this year to support our ambition for Scotland to be as attractive and welcoming as possible by helping employers use the immigration system to fill skills needs and support individuals to move to and settle in Scotland. Ben McPherson. I thank the Minister for that substantial answer and I appreciate the need for actions to try to address depopulation in some areas of Scotland. Conversely, however, we also uh, require actions to meet the growing needs of areas with significant growing populations like my constituency of Edinburgh, Northern and Leith. Therefore, as the Scottish Government begins to consider its budget for the year 24-25, Will the Ministerial Task Force examine rapid population growth in the Lothians? And will it consider meeting with Lothian MSPs, uh, local councils, NHS Lothian and other relevant bodies uh, to hear about the pressures and concerns? Minister. As the Minister responsible for population, I'm more than happy to, to meet with anyone to discuss the, the impact of a lack of a balanced population, which I know affects both those facing depopulation and rapid growth in, in different ways. Uh, the Scottish Government did undertake exploratory research in 2023 about the drivers and implications of rapid localised growth, which was considered by the Ministerial Population Task Force and local government partners. As a next step, COSLA is currently working with local authorities to develop an enhanced understanding of the implications of population growth, particularly in East Coast local authority areas. We are engaging directly with local authorities through the Joint Scottish Government COSLA Population Roundtable to hear about those distinct challenges, and that work will build on our understanding of these challenges and inform the next steps of the Ministerial Population Task Force. Let's pick up the pace, colleagues. Question number six, Gillian Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government what public health measures are being taken to minimise harm from vaping prior to the introduction of the proposed ban on single-use vapes. Minister Jenny Minto. Our tobacco and vaping framework published in November 2023 committed to taking action to reduce vaping amongst non-smokers and young people. Vapes should not be used by young people or adult non-smokers. They are a, one of a range of possible cessation tools available for existing smokers to quit. Alongside the framework, we launched the Take Hold marketing campaign, which successfully increased parents, carers and children's awareness of the harms and risks of nicotine addiction from vaping. New resources on vaping were also launched on Parent Club, NHS Inform and Young Scott. We continue to work across the four nations on progressing the outcomes from the smoke-free generation consultation. Julian Mackay. Organisations are concerned about how disposable or single use are defined. They are concerned that manufacturers may try to add a USB port to a disposable vape to get around poten potential regulation as well as the potential scope of exemptions within the regulations. Could the Minister provide some assurances on these issues and detail any other work that is underway while we wait for a ban to be in place, such as instructing retailers to put vapes behind cover and tackling advertising? Minister. 
Scottish Government has published its draft regulations which defines a single use vape as a vape which is not designed or intended to be reused and includes any vape which is not refillable, not rechargeable or not refillable and not rechargeable. This is to support any future design changes to these devices. Organisations can view the full proposed de definition in the draft regulations on the Scottish Government website and we are currently working closely, as I have said, with other UK nations to ensure a consistent definition across the UK and with trading standard officers and other organisations to ensure the definition is fit for purpose. Question number seven, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last discussed NHS Dumfries and Galloway's funding deficit with the NHS Board. Cabinet Secretary Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Over half a billion uh, increased investment is provided for frontline NHS boards in the 24-25 budget, a real terms uplift and taking total funding to £13.2 billion. Despite uh, our significant investment, the system is under extreme pressure as a result of the ongoing impacts of COVID, Brexit, inflation, the cost crisis and uh, UK government spending decisions. The Scottish Government's Financial Delivery Unit is in ongoing contact with all boards to address the financial challenge. This includes scrutiny and challenge of financial plans and agreeing actions to support recurring savings and financial sustainability. Uh, the FDU last met with NHS Dumfries and Galloway on the 4th of March. Colin Smith. <coughs> NHS Dumfries and Galloway have projected they will face a £54 million deficit by March 2025 and the Scottish Government have ordered them to find £29 million in savings in the forthcoming year alone. In a region where you can't find an NHS dentist to register with, where mums-to-be in Wigtonshire have to travel a 150-mile round trip to Dumfries to give birth because the maternity unit in Stranra remains closed, where cottage hospitals closed to deal with COVID haven't reopened, where there are record vacancies for consultants and record waiting lists, where exactly does the Cabinet Secretary expect NHS Dumfries and Galloway to make cuts of nearly £30 million in the next year alone without having a devastating impact on patient care. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I, I, I thank Colin uh, Smith for his question and his interest in, in this area. Despite our significant uh, investment that I have already outlined, all the NHS boards, like other uh, public services, are under unprecedented pressure as a result of inflation, uh, a result of yesterday's uh, budget, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and this support uh, that we're providing through the likes of the Financial uh, Delivery Unit is uh, funding to cover uh, pay increases, scrutiny and challenge of three-year financial plans, considering and reviewing the financial impact of national and local service planning options, work to deliver recurring savings uh, of a minimum of 3%, supported by our sustainability and value programme and the Financial Improvement Group. So that targeted additional support through the Scottish Government's uh, FDU it will be there to monitor and support boards in their financial performance and support financial improvement. But I recognise the, the challenges that Colin Smith has set out, and I'll continue to work with boards in order to ensure that we can see continued progression and improvement in our health service, uh, whilst also addressing the significant financial challenges we're facing. Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, new statistics released this week revealed that January of this year was the worst month ever for long waits at Scotland's A&E departments. Almost 9,000 patients waited over half a day for emergency treatment. We spoke to Kirstine Campbell from Rosher. She spent over seven hours in a waiting room at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital after experiencing symptoms of a heart attack or blood clot during a visit to Clyde Bank. To alleviate the pain she was in, Kirstine had to lie on the floor. She told me surrounded by vomit and other bodily fluids because there was no bed available. So what does Hamza Youssef have to say to Kirstein and how is he going to fix this problem? First Minister. Officer, <coughs> before I answer uh, Douglas Ross's question, I did want to just um, say, and on behalf of the Scottish Government and indeed the party that I lead, that uh, how sad uh, we were about the tragic news of the loss of Nick Sheridan. Uh, Nick was an extremely talented journalist and author. Uh, he'll be greatly missed. Uh, many of us in this chamber will have been questioned by Nick uh, quite robustly, no doubt, whether it was on BBC Drive Time or many of the other programmes that he presented. My thoughts are with his family, his many friends and indeed his colleagues. It will undoubtedly be a very sad time uh, indeed, President Officer. In terms of uh, the question that Douglas Ross uh, asked, a very serious question, 
Uh, of course, uh, indeed, what I would say to Kirstine Campbell and anybody else that's had to wait too long is, first and foremost, this government apologises to anybody who has to wait longer than any of us would expect uh, in relation to a &E treatment or, indeed, uh, when it comes to elective care or diagnostics. But it is precisely because we're still recovering from that global pandemic, which has affected every single health service in the country, that the Deputy First Minister stood here and ensured that we have record funding, over £19.5 billion of funding, going into the NHS. It's also why, of course, we ensured that those who are at the front line, who are dealing with the likes of Kirstein, treating Kirstein, caring for Kirstein, and many other patients across Scotland, we ensure that they are the best paid in the entire UK. It's why we ensured that we increased their pay uh, to record levels. It's why, of course, we've also increased staffing levels by historic highs under this uh, government. So is the long waits, are the long waits that too many patients uh, have to endure acceptable? Not at all. And that is why we're investing in our NHS. That's why we're investing in our staff. What makes that far more difficult, of course, is when we have those real-term budget cuts that come from Westminster that, that slash public spending, uh, not just in NHS England, but then have a consequence here in Scotland. So this government will continue to invest in our NHS, but most crucially continue to invest in our NHS staff, who do an incredible job day in and day out. Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Scottish Conservatives, can I also uh, pay tribute to Nick Sheridan? I have been uh, interviewed by him in the past, and he was uh, a robust but extremely professional uh, journalist. And I know his loss will be felt so much by his family and his friends, uh, and in particular his colleagues at the BBC and across the media, uh, with whom he was so highly uh, regarded. Uh, but I listened carefully to the First Minister's answer there, and the example I gave uh, about Kirstein and a &E departments in question one, is replicated across our NHS. This week, we also learned that patients are nearly 30 times more likely to be waiting over two years for treatment in Scotland's NHS than they would be south of the border. There are more than 8,000 patients waiting over two years for treatment in Scotland's NHS. 8,000 waiting over two years. Does Hamza Yusuf think it's acceptable for one person, never mind thousands, to wait more than two years for treatment? And what is he planning to do specifically to deal with these appalling waits for treatment? First Minister. In my, my first response that we don't believe that anybody who has to endure a long wait, be it for unscheduled care, be it for elective care, be it for diagnostics, is acceptable. But we also, of course, all understand, I hope, that the impact of the global pandemic has affected health services, not just in Scotland, but right across the world. Douglas Ross asks, what are we doing about it? It's because of our investment in the NHS, because of that record investment in the NHS, that we are seeing progress, we are seeing recovery. If I looked at the statistics that were out this week that Douglas Ross uh, references, for example, we saw that in operations performed, uh, there was an increase in January of 15% compared to the month before. And in fact, if we compare to January from the year before, there was a 16% increase. That shows, of course, activity moving in the right directions. In January, uh, we saw January of this year, 702 operations carried out each day. That compares to 604 in the January prior. We look at long waits. There have been uh, some, uh, again, elements of recovery. We look at those who are waiting over two years in terms of new outpatients. That's down 66%. If I look at two-year uh, inpatients and day case, uh, cases, down 25%. And Douglas Ross asks again, what specifically are you doing about it? Well, we're making sure that we're investing in our capacity. That's why through our network of treatment centres, for example, 20,000 additional sur uh, surgeries, uh, we've provided that capacity. But I go back to my central point and end on this point, presiding officer. We're investing record amounts in our NHS. We're investing in our staff. We're making sure they're the best paid. That job becomes immeasurably difficult yeah. when we have a UK government yeah. that is taking £500 million pounds over, out of our budget in real terms yeah. over the last two years. And for that, Douglas Ross really needs to use whatever influence, and we know, of course, he doesn't have much influence, but whatever influence yeah. Briefly, he First has Minister. to make sure that the Conservatives fund public services, not slashed them to the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Douglas Ross. I think it's really important when we're speaking about our NHS and patients, we speak to those 8,000 people across Scotland who are suffering, waiting over two years. 
We'll just suspend this meeting briefly. Thank you, colleagues. We will resume our business and I go to Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was saying to the 8,000 people in Scotland waiting more than two years for treatment, they want to hear more from Scotland's First Minister about how he is going to deal with this. And unsurprisingly, Hamza Youssef is still blaming COVID, but the crisis in Scotland's NHS has continued to get worse since the pandemic. Since Hamza Youssef became First Minister, more than half a million days have been lost due to delayed discharge. That means over the last 12 months, half a million hospital beds that could have been available for other patients. Now, the SNP promised, they promised to eradicate delayed discharge eight years ago. If they'd done that, as they promised, well, I, I think the First Minister just said that's stupid. It was a promise. It was a promise. It was a promise. <laughs> from colleagues, the SNP colleagues, government. Colleagues, let's conduct well, they were our business in an orderly fashion. We were disagreeing with something, so I'll be interested to know, is the First Minister disagreeing that it was a promise to eradicate completely delayed discharge eight years ago? Because if they had done that, waiting times would have been lower for emergency care, for ambulances and for emergency treatment. So can I ask Hamza Youssef, how costly has that failure to eradicate delayed discharge been to patients waiting in Scotland's NHS? First Minister. First of all, uh, Plain Officer Douglas Ross really should uh, withdraw and retract his comment. I, I didn't say anything, in fact, well, Douglas Ross, I didn't say anything, actually. Uh, Colleagues, say First, Minister, First Minister, if I might just ask you to, to take a seat. It's exceptionally important that we conduct our business in an orderly fashion. The way that we can best do that, the way that we can best do that is not to shout and point at one another. It's to ensure that when the person who's been called to speak, they have an opportunity to do that and that we listen respectfully. First Minister. Yes, and that's right, Presiding Officer. I mean, Douglas Ross, uh, clearly, uh, having been left hung out to dry by his own colleagues, is desperate yeah. to simply just make up uh, what is being said yeah. or not being said. And what I would say, Presiding Officer, in terms of when it comes to when it comes to the NHS here in Scotland, uh, I'm very uh, proud of the fact that the actions that we have taken means that Scotland remains the only country in the UK where we've not lost a single day to NHS strike action anywhere in the UK. And when it comes to, when it comes to social care, which Douglas Ross is absolutely right to point to, Brexit, of course, has been a complete yep. and utter disaster for social care recruitment. <laughs> and not only that, the recent changes to migration and the migration rules yeah. have been described as absolutely devastating by those who work yeah. in social care, presiding uh, yeah. officer. Add to that what I've already said, a real terms cut to our budget over the last couple yeah. of years and indeed a £1.3 billion pound cut to our capital, which directly affects yeah. health infrastructure then we are attempting to recover our NHS in the face of over 14, 14 years of conservative austerity, yeah. presiding officer. So the Scottish Government, the SNP-led Scottish Government, will invest in our NHS, make sure we have record staffing levels, the best paid NHS staff anywhere in the UK, and will continue to make sure that we invest in our public services while Douglas Ross and his party take a hatchet to public services right across the UK. Douglas Ross. Last week, one whistleblower in NHS Grampian revealed to the Press and Journal paper that at one stage, 18 ambulances were stuck outside Aberdeen Royal Infirmary. The whistleblower said this could have been up to half of the North East fleet of ambulances 
stuck in one place, unable to leave, instead of supporting and protecting the communities we serve. I can repeat this if the First Minister is getting advice from the Health Secretary, because I think it's really, I think it's really important. Please continue, Mr. Ross. I think it's really important. I think it's really important that the First Minister listens to what our professionals are saying in Scotland's NHS. Because this whistleblower in NHS Grampian continued. What? Is, is that the response we're going to get from a Cabinet Secretary in this Ms. Scottish Ms. Government? Ms. And I hope that is withdrawn. Ms. I hope that is withdrawn. Mr Ross. I hope that is withdrawn. Mr Ross. Can I just say that I did not hear the comment that you have obviously heard, Mr Ross, from the floor, but it is absolutely essential that members desist from any commentary when their colleagues are putting questions to one another and responding to them. We are not going to continue in this vein. I would be grateful if members would remind themselves of standing orders and the need to treat one another with courtesy and respect. Mr Ross. I can't believe Angus Robertson is smirking after seeing that when I am quoting from an ambulance worker in NHS Grampian. So I will continue to read out their words because they seem to be uncomfortable for this SNP government. This whistleblower in NHS Grampian continued, many of my colleagues share a concern that we are unable to help those most in need because we are tied up at hospital and not where they need us to be. And this is happening across Scotland. We spoke to Ian Black, who gave up waiting for an ambulance after 15 hours when he was told that Monklands Hospital was full. When he eventually got an ambulance the following morning, it emerged he'd suffered a stroke. Ian's still alive to explain his situation, but if this happened to other people, they might not be. Waiting 15 hours for an ambulance after a stroke will be fatal in other circumstances. So will the First Minister please take this more seriously than others on his front bench and tell us what urgent action he is taking to stop ambulances being stuck outside Scotland's hospitals because people will lose their lives if he does not? First Minister. Officer, of course we take this uh, issue seriously. I, I, I'm not sure why Douglas Ross uh, is so uh, rattled this uh, session of First Minister's questions. He mentioned the pre Press and Journal. It may be something to do, of course, uh, with a, a great paper which I read uh, many on uh, regulari with regularity, Presiding Officer. Members. In terms of the health, channel the health challenges that those across the country are facing, and no doubt that the Scottish Ambulance Service is also facing those challenges. That is why we have increased the funding for the Scottish Ambulance Service uh, in the next financial year. And, of course, in this financial year, we assured that the Scottish Ambulance Service was provided £50 million. That funding, of course, helped them recruit an additional 317 staff by April of this year. So we are increasing the staff, recruiting more staff, where we possibly can. There is no getting away from the fact, presenting officer, that the global pandemic impacted on health services right across the country and including, of course, here in Scotland. Despite that, despite that, and thanks to the effort of incredible paramedics, incredible Agenda for Change staff, incredible doctors uh, up and down this country, that's why we have and continue to have the best performing a and &E in comparison to other parts of the UK. It's why we have the best paid staff in comparison to the UK. It's why we have more qualified nurses and midwives per head than in England. That's why we've not lost a single day of uh, NHS activity to strike action. It's why when we look at waiting times, uh, for example, we have made improvements and recovery, but there is still far more for us to do. So this government is not just committed to the NHS, we'll support it in its greatest hour of need by ensuring it has that record investment, that record over £19.5 billion investment in very stark contrast to the UK Conservative government that has slashed public spending to the absolute bone so that Douglas Ross and high earners can get a tax cut. That is the wrong priorities, yeah. presiding yeah. officer. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, presiding, thank you, presiding officer. We will suspend briefly.
We will resume once more. And at question number two, I call Anna Sarwar. Thank you, President Officer. Can I start by echoing the comments about Nick Sheridan? He was a young, talented and charismatic journalist with a huge future ahead of him. And our thoughts are with his family, friends and all his colleagues at the BBC. Uh, President Officer, when we're discussing issues of life and death in our NHS, I think, frankly, patients across Scotland deserve better than what they've seen in the last 20 minutes here at First Minister's Questions. The treatment time guarantee is a legally binding maximum waiting time of 12 weeks from referral to treatment. How many times have the SNP government broken this law? First Minister. Uh, President Officer, well, I don't have that figure uh, to hand. There's no doubt, of course, that we have seen increases uh, in waits and long waits due again to the global uh, pandemic. We know there were challenges before the global pandemic, and that's fair uh, to reference, but we're also making progress in terms of those long waits. But we are investing in a recovery, uh, and that's why we've seen, for example, operations that were performed in January of this year increasing by 15 per cent in comparison to the month before. But these are challenges that are faced right across uh, the UK. If I look at the data for the 31st of December 2023, it shows that in Scotland there were 124 patients per thousand of the population for treatment time uh, guarantee that were waiting uh, and new outpatient uh, appointments as well. Uh, this is fewer in England, where 134 patients per thousand are on the RTT, referral to treatment waiting list, and Wales, where the figure is 244 uh, per, per thousand. So that is cold comfort, of course, to those that are waiting in Scotland. But the point being, of course, these are uh, issues that are impacting our health service right across the UK. So I go back to the point I was making uh, to Douglas Ross, to Anna Sawar. Uh, we are investing in that recovery and beginning to see progress in relation to the reduction of those who are waiting the longest and indeed in terms of activity in the NHS going up. So this government will continue to invest in our NHS with record funding of over £19.5 Anna Sarwar. President officer, it is written in law that a patient should be treated within 12 weeks. The SNP have broken this law over 680,000 times. And Hamza Yusuf might try and blame the pandemic, but this law was broken over 320,000 times before COVID. Shona Robeson broke the law 158,000 times. Michael Matheson broke the law 184,000 times. And Hamza Yusuf broke the law 235,000 times. And since he published his so-called NHS recovery plan, the SNP have broken the law 306,735 times. Every one of these breaches is someone waiting anxiously for a medical procedure, often in pain. Many have put their lives on hold, stopped work or retired because of their condition. And too many of them have been forced to go private in the middle of a cost of living crisis just to stop the pain. So, First Minister, will you apologise to the 680,000 people your government has failed by breaking this law? First Minister. Presiding officer, I already uh, said to, in response to Douglas Ross, of course this government apologises and, and regrets anybody having to wait longer, uh, whether it's for unscheduled care, whether it's for long waits, whether it's treatment time guarantees. Uh, we, of course, don't want a single person waiting longer, a day longer, uh, a minute longer uh, than they have to do. But what Anna Sawar does is completely ignores the impact of the pandemic. He does this every time he talks about the health service. The pandemic, of course, was the biggest shock our NHS has faced in its 75-year existence. There was, of course, progress being made in relation uh, to waiting times before the pandemic. Uh, but, of course, there's no doubt uh, that, rec that uh, the impact of the global pandemic has been severe uh, on our health service. I go back to the point that we are beginning to see uh, some uh, improvements. We're beginning to see activity increase when it comes to, for example, those who've waited the longest, those two-year waits. Uh, for outpatients, we've seen a reduction of new outpatient appointments, a reduction by 66 per cent uh, from the end of June 22. And for those inpatients, or day case treatments reduced by around about a quarter. And what are we doing about that? We're ensuring an increased a capacity for 20,000 additional surgeries. We've also provided seven mobile MRI and three mobile CT scanners to increase Briefly, First Minister. additional activity. And we're also supporting uh, mobile operating theatres right up and down uh, the country. But I go back to the point I made to Douglas Ross Tanner Satwar, that we're doing all of this in the face of 14 years of UK Tory austerity and a real terms cut to our budget. Much better for us that we had control over our own finances so we wouldn't be at the, at the, at the behest 
of cruel Westminster governments who continue to cut our budget, Presiding Officer. Anna Sarwar. Presiding Officer, 17 years in government, and that's the best answer they've got, seriously. Because across nearly every measure, this government has failed. They have broken the treatment time guarantee law 680,000 times, 320,000 times before the pandemic. Now, Hamza Yusuf wants to pretend that things are getting better. But let's look at the NHS stats published just this week. A third of patients not being seen within four hours in our a &Es. Over 8,500 people waiting more than 12 hours in one month. 55,000 fewer planned operations in the past year compared to before the pandemic. 5,500 children waiting to receive mental health treatment. And one in five people getting crucial bowel cancer tests. Oh, no, sorry, only one in five people uh, getting crucial bowel cancer tests on time. Shocking when cancer remains Scotland's biggest killer. So, First Minister, do you accept that waiting time standards exist for a reason? That every time they are missed, it puts lives at risk? And that your government's incompetence is destroying the NHS and failing staff and patients? First Minister. It is, of course. We will suspend once more. I call upon the First Minister to respond. Presiding Officer, um, let me go back to, of course, uh, the fact of the matter that the global pandemic has undoubtedly caused real challenges for health services right across the UK, including in Labour-run Wales and Conservative-run England, and of course, where we are in charge here of the NHS in Scotland. But statistics this week have also, of course, shown the, 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 the output, the outcome of that record investment that we've made in the NHS, i.e. headcount in the NHS is at record high levels. And also, of course, that we have made improvements in CAMS as well, that was referenced yep. by Anna Sawa. Still improvements to be made, still work to be done. But we continue to see sustained improvements yep. in CAMS weights. National performance against the 18-week CAM standard, the fourth highest since records began, the highest achieved since quarter ending March 2016. We've also seen increases in CAMS staffing uh, as well. But I end on the point that I made to Anna Sarwar and indeed to Douglas Ross a moment ago. Uh, we know that the NHS is struggling as a result of the global pandemic. That's why we're investing over £19.5 in the most precious institution, our National Health Service. But we're doing that in the face of a real terms cut over the last couple of years from the Conservative government. What makes that even more difficult, of course, is that when Labour's general election coordinator is asked if he disagrees with a single yeah. Conservative yeah. budget proposal, he says no. Yeah. They have the same spending plans as the Conservatives. Yeah. So whether it's Labour austerity or Conservative austerity, presiding officer, Westminster austerity is going to continue to undoubtedly impact and damage our public services. And in the face of that, this government makes no apologies for record investment in our NHS. Question number three, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government can take to help encourage children into sport and cultivate future world-class athletes in the light of recent successes of Josh Kerr and Gemma Riki at the World Indoor Athletics Championships in Glasgow. First Minister. Well, let me uh, also offer huge congratulations to both Josh and Gemma on their fantastic medal-winning performances. Let me also thank the team at Glasgow and all those involved uh, in, of course, the World Indoor Athletic Championships uh, for the incredible work that they uh, have done in putting on a spectacular uh, championships uh, earlier this month. We know that uh, being physically active is one of the best things that all children and young people can do to help their social, physical and, of course, their mental well-being as well. As set out in the programme for government, we're working with Sports Scotland to ensure active schools programmes are free for all children and young people by the end of this parliament providing them with more opportunities to take part in sport before, during and after school. 
Sports Scotland's investment helps to support key partners excuse me, to deliver programmes that address the inequalities that exist in access to sport and physical activity uh, by increasing participation, creating a pathway for success at every level in all sports. Uh, we will ensure anyone can Scot in, in Scotland does and can achieve their full potential. Brian Whittle. Can I thank the First Minister for that answer and quickly point out that we don't just have Josh and Gemma. We also have previous World 1500 metre champion Jake Whiteman and Olympic medalist Laura Muir in the middle distance events, or to give middle distance events uh, the full title, uh, proper sport. Um, I, uh, I cannot wait for the Olympics. But First Minister, uh, as much as these athletes are inspirational to our young budding sports people, these young people have to be able to access sport. School sport is on the decline, and local authorities are closing so many of our public sports facilities, or at least having to increase charges. Access to sport is on a very steep decline. So can I ask the First Minister, with the huge societal, community, health and educational benefits that sport brings, does he agree with me that cutting those opportunities for participation is a false economy? First Minister. Uh, we will suspend once more. We will resume once more and I call Brian Whittle. I've asked my question. <laughs> I'll do it again if you like. <laughs> Smashing. That being the case, I call the First Minister. In fairness, Presiding Officer, it was a good question. I don't think he has to, uh, Brian Whittle has to uh, repeat it. Um, uh, can I say uh, to Brian Whittle, I know he's had a long standing, of course, interest uh, himself, of course, uh, being an accomplished uh, athlete. I was going to say. I was going to say at one time, but uh, I think uh, still continues to be uh, an accomplished athlete of sorts. Uh, also. Um, I will stop digging uh, and move on, presenting officer. Uh, Brian Whittle was right to mention Jake Whiteman, Laura Muir, Dash, Elish McCoggan, and of course many other of our fantastic Scottish uh, athletes uh, to that list. What I would say to give some reassurance to Brian Whittle, if I can, um, across 23-24, uh, Sports Scotland are investing. £36.7 million pounds of Scottish Government and National Lottery funding uh, into Scottish governing, uh, Scottish governing uh, bodies uh, of uh, sports, and uh, this increase represents uh, an 8.6 per cent increase in the previous year. Uh, but his point is well made around uh, local uh, facilities. That's why this Government is providing uh, local government with record funding of more than £14 uh, billion. Pounds. That's a real terms uh, increase, uh, despite the real terms budget cuts that I mentioned. But I go back to the point I've made throughout this uh, First Minister's questions, Presiding Officer. Uh, this would be far easier to support local government, to support our sports facilities, if we weren't facing a £500 million cut over two years uh, to our budget, or indeed a £1.3 billion cut to our capital budget. So any influence at all that Scottish Tories have which seems very minimal indeed, uh, to help their Conservative colleagues down, uh, in the UK government to make sure their spending on public services would be much appreciated. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. Having the opportunity to share in sporting victories can play an important part in helping to encourage children into sport. Does the First Minister therefore agree with me that showing Scotland's men's and women's football matches on free-to-air TV could help to inspire the next generation of ta talent? Can he advise what steps can be taken to open up these games to as wide an audience as possible. First Minister. Yeah, I do agree with uh, Fulton uh, McGregor in, in, in uh, his question. I agree that we want to ensure our children don't miss out uh, on the opportunity of being inspired by seeing their footballing uh, heroes play, but not just the children. Uh, of course, we know we want to encourage everybody at any stage of their life to become physically active and being able to watch uh, sporting activity uh, and particularly uh, in relation uh, to some very important football matches and football tournaments coming up uh, this year uh, could inspire, we know, a whole generation of boys and girls to take up uh, the sport. So while broadcasting and the listed events regime are reserved, we want a fairer and more representative service for Scotland. We continue to argue for its improvement and ensure that it better reflects 
and prioritises the interests of Scottish audiences. We will continue to advocate for the inclusion of national football matches, such as qualifiers for future World Cups and European Championships, to be included in the regime. We have written to the Secretary of State and DCMS on a number of occasions on this matter, but I am afraid without any reply whatsoever. Question number four, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what impact the Spring Statement will have on Scotland. First well, the Spring Statement marks another failure by the UK Government to deliver funding for the people and the public services of Scotland. The combined cut of national insurance across autumn and spring statements equates to the loss of up to £1.6 billion pounds and potential consequentials for Scotland. That's £1.6 billion. Pounds. We could be spending further on the NHS, on education, on transport, on our justice services and all of our public services. Health consequentials of £237 million are nowhere near enough given the pressures we face. They don't cover, for example, the recurring cost yep. of the Agenda for Change pay deal. Based on the latest forecast, our block grant for capital is now expected to reduce in real terms uh, by £1.3 billion pounds by 27 28. The absence of investment in public services and infrastructure is nothing, frankly, short of a betrayal of our public services by the UK Government. Yeah. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. Answer. We will suspend once more. It is extremely regrettable that the opportunity of elected representatives to put questions to the First Minister is being disrupted today. Um, and I'd just like to assure members, well, members will be aware of the steps that Parliament has required to take um, as a result of previous disruptions, but we'll certainly review today's events um, because it is extremely, I mean, it's absolutely essential in a democracy that members have this opportunity to put questions to the First Minister. And I call Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the First Minister for his answer. The toxic Tory legacy of Boris Johnson, Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak is that for the first time per capita incomes at the end of this UK Parliament will be lower than at the beginning. Does the First Minister agree with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce that the overriding impression is that the Chancellor's long-term plan to address the economic stagnation has been left for another day? Will Citizens advise Scotland that there was a complete absence of the kind of support those on lower incomes need? And with Douglas Ross, who said that he was deeply disappointed that the one-year extension of the windfall tax to the oil and gas industry is a step in the wrong direction? First Minister. Uh, I hesitate to say that I agree with Douglas Ross, and I have to say, uh, but, I, but on this occasion, when Douglas Ross said the Chancellor's budget was going to harm uh, Scotland, was bad for Scotland, it's probably the first time Douglas Ross has ever been in tune with Scottish public opinion, uh, presiding uh, officer. So disastrous a betrayal of workers in the North East. Apparently, Douglas Ross uh, threatened uh, to resign, but he's still sitting here. I wonder if he sold out the North East for a peerage or indeed to be a Privy Councillor. We don't know, but I'm sure in time, Presiding Officer, we'll find out, because Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right. The Tories over 14 years of economic mismanagement have imposed upon this country a disastrous Brexit we didn't vote for. They've ushered in a cost of living crisis from a government that we didn't elect. And for the first time in record, as Kenneth Gibson rightly says, the economy is set to be sm smaller in real terms uh, per capita at the time of the next general election than it was at the previous election. And astonishingly, Labour don't oppose a single measure in the budget. So what, is, what we know, First Minister, officer, is whether it's Labour or Conservatives, that Westminster doesn't work for Scotland. Yeah. We'll suspend briefly.
I call Liz Smith. Thank you. Uh, the Chancellor's budget did actually prioritise improving public sector output and efficiency. For example, three, for example, three billion pounds going to the NHS to update IT and, and to streamline all the data and AI. Can I ask the First Minister when we will see similar changes in Scotland for public sector reform as the Finance Committee has been calling for? Yeah. First Minister. I mean, uh, uh, brave is one word for Liz Smith's intervention, Presiding Officer, because of course we won't see a single penny of that investment yeah. this year or indeed yeah. the next financial year. They've kicked that investment into the long grass, yeah. but of course her party will be out of power and quite rightly so, Presiding yeah. Officer. Yeah. When it comes to the priorities of the Conservative UK Government. What they've prioritised is a tax cut for Liz Smith, a tax cut for higher earners to the tune of £1,500, while at the same time slashing public spending to the bone. That's the priority of the Conservative Party. Apparently, it's the priority of the Labour Party, who don't oppose a single measure in the Conservatives' budget. Is it any wonder, presiding officer, that people in Scotland know that Westminster doesn't work for Scotland and only the SNP will stand up for this country? Question number five, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, presiding, thank you, presiding officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government is taking to promote community deer management on publicly owned land. First Minister. Through a pioneering pilot project, Nature Scott, that have been supporting community deer stalking at Craig Meggie Nature, uh, National Nature Reserve. Uh, the initiative giving those living nearby the opportunity to learn deer management skills when fully trained and qualified, uh, giving them access to the reserve to shoot deer in season for their own consumption. Crown Estate Scotland also support access to land for deer management by letting their shooting rights to local shooting associations and syndicates. Community deer management models are common in many European countries and the Scottish Government's... We'll suspend briefly. Thank you. We can resume. I call the First Minister. Of, this, uh, of course, these constant interruptions are uh, deeply uh, frustrating, I know. But, uh, of course, the issues of food security and poverty are very, very important to the government that I lead. And it's up to protesters to decide uh, where they protest. But I would say to them gently, I think they're protesting at the wrong parliament. Yeah. Because, of course, it is Westminster First Minister, I would be grateful if you could address issues. Sharon Derby's question. In terms of the issues at hand, presiding officer, I, I won't repeat uh, the full answer. But I will say that community deer management models are common in many European countries. And the Scottish Government Deer Board, which met on Monday, discussed the findings from Craig Meggy. Uh, we want to ensure that local communities are indeed reaping the benefits as we step up deer management in Scotland to meet our climate and our nature aims. Sharon Dowie. Thank you for that answer. There are numerous benefits of community integrated deer management. It builds resilience and opportunities in local communities, reduces the burden of large deer contracts in the taxpayer and helps protect the environment across areas such as the Carrick Forest in Ayrshire. Local wild venison is a fantastic sustainable food source to be harvested, processed and consumed that we must champion. And I note the work of the British Association for Shooting and Conservation and the Country Food Trust who are in Parliament this week. Does the First Minister agree that the Scottish Government must do more work with rural stakeholders such as Basque to bolster Scotland's venison potential? First Minister. Well, I agree with a lot of what uh, Sharon Dowie uh, has said. Uh, we know that uh, effective deer management uh, can help to tackle the twin uh, climate and biodiversity uh, crisis. Uh, local communities, we want them to benefit uh, from uh, deer management uh, and they can benefit both in terms of socio-economic opportunities, but also, as Sharon Dowie rightly says, from venison as a healthy and nutritious uh, food source. Uh, I'm more than happy to ensure that the uh, Cabinet Secretary writes to Sharon Dowie with details of how we're supporting effective deer management. Of course, I would make the point, as I'm sure Darren, Sharon Dowie is aware, that we are intending to bring forward legislation which ensures effective deer management uh, in the context of the twin climate 
and biodiversity crisis. In fact, the consultation is still open until the 29th uh, of uh, March. But we will continue to uh, engage with rural stakeholders, Bass included, and others to ensure effective deer management uh, for Scotland. Alistair Allen. Can the First Minister say whether the Scottish Government will give consideration to replicating pilots like the one undertaken uh, at Craig Meggy uh, on areas of publicly owned land in the Crofton counties to allow crofters to, subject to the proper training, take in-season deer for their own consumption or potentially settling on, thereby incentivising their participation in this vital strand of nature restoration? First Minister. It is certainly worthy uh, of uh, consideration. I think it's important that local communities right across Scotland are able to benefit from deer management through, as I've said, both socio-economic opportunities, but also from the fact that venison uh, is a healthy and nutritious food source. Uh, given the success of the Craig Meggie uh, pilot project, I'm keen that we support more community-led deer management schemes. I know that the Minister of Green Skills, Circular Economy and Biodiversity is looking at what more can be done to establish more uh, schemes uh, and would be happy to discuss this in more detail with the member. Question number six, Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of International Women's Day on the 8th of March, what steps the Scottish Government is taking to ta tackle gender-based violence? First Minister. Over the past week, there has rightly been a sharp focus on the violence women and girls face, uh, predominantly at the hands of men. Uh, we have to stand against that collectively and we must tackle the societal attitudes and root out the toxic behaviours that underpin uh, those actions that lead to such abuse and to such violence against women. The government is doing this through our Equally Safe strategy, which focuses, focuses on early intervention, prevention and support services. And of course, we want to go further and do more. We also want to transform how our justice system responds to sexual violence and ensure that women and girls have confidence in a justice system which will effectively hold perpetrators to account and, crucially, won't re-traumatise those women who have suffered such abuse. That's why our Victims, Witnesses and Justice Reform Bill is so important and can also play a major role in supporting survivors and the victims of gender-based violence. Rona Mackay. Thank the First Minister for that answer. I'm speaking about the Government's proposals for a sexual offences court. Scotland's second highest judge, Lady Dorian, said to the Criminal Justice Committee, and I quote, The fact is there's no option to do nothing. Either you embed this in a new culture in a court of uniform practice across the country, or you try to embed it piecemeal. First Minister, is it proposals like a specialist court that can build confidence in our justice system for women and girls and improve the experience of complainers? First Minister. Absolutely, presiding officer. St establishing the Sexual Offences Court, alongside a raft of other measures intended to improve the experience of victims contained within the Victims, Witnesses mm -hmm. and Justice Reform Bill, can play a crucial role in building the confidence of women and girls in our justice system. Lady Dorian is absolutely right. There is no option to do nothing. That's simply not an option that anybody in this chamber can or should be considering. Piecemeal reform will fail to deliver the changes in culture that we so desperately need. Uh, those changes in culture, those changes in processes, those changes in practice that are clearly necessary. It's only through systematic reform to our court system, including the creation of a sexual offences court, that we can embed a culture that supports victims, supports survivors of sexual offences, gives them the confidence that they will be treated with dignity and respect within a system that effectively holds perpetrators to account. So I'd encourage everyone in this chamber to support the important proposals that are contained within this bill. Pauline McNeill. Image-based abuse is often where girls are coerced into creating or sharing nude images and shared to someone else without their consent. But a report by Revealing Reality, a think tank funded by the Home Office, found it was a particular problem in pupils at school and it found that many boys sharing nude images without consent was seen as a way to gain respect from their male peers. And the report also found that boys often do not understand what they are doing is abusive. I would like to acknowledge the work the Scottish Government is doing on this, Cabinet Secretary General Ruth and also Minister Siobhan Brown. Um, but would the First Minister consider that we should conduct some research, not only on the impact on girls of this, but to examine the extent of it so we're clear what it is exactly we are trying to tackle? First Minister. I am happy to uh, consider the suggestions that Pauline McNeill uh, has made, and I want to pay tribute to Pauline McNeill as well, who's a long uh, track record of tackling, standing up uh, against uh, violence against women uh, and girls in this parliament. 
Um, the, the, the abusive uh, behaviour and sexual harm Scotland Act of 2016 uh, does make it a criminal offence to share intimate images without uh, consent. There are a wide uh, range of laws that relate to image-based uh, sexual uh, abuse. But I agree with um, Polly McNeill. It isn't just about legislation and laws. They're important, of course, in their own right. Oh. We will suspend briefly. First Minister. Uh, I won't repeat again everything uh, I've already said, but uh, as well as the importance of laws and legislation, which I know Polly McNeill recognises, she makes a very important point about understanding the nature of the problem, the extent of the problem, and how we deal with that. And I was, well, I was pleased to be at Moffat Academy earlier this week with the Cabinet Secretary for edu Education, where we launched uh, our uh, gender based violence in schools uh, guidance. Uh, published this week and making it clear uh, that, uh, that, that the sharing of uh, sexual images uh, was, uh, uh, was, of course, uh, unacceptable, but also giving guidance and the appropriate tools to schools to address uh, those uh, issues. And one of the projects that we heard about at Moffat Academy uh, was the Mentors in Violence Prevention Programme, which empowers uh, students, pupils, particularly older pupils, to be able to talk to younger pupils about the importance of issues such as consent uh, and so on uh, and so forth. And I'll continue to do the work that uh, I am leading in relation uh, to positive masculinity so that we can have uh, and collectively uh, work with young boys, work with young men to eradicate those toxic behaviours we see that are far too prevalent in our society. But I, continue, I look forward to continuing to working with Paul McNeill and those across the chamber as we work together to tackle gender-based violence. Question number seven, Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what action the Scottish Government has taken to reduce waiting times for children referred for a neurodevelopmental assessment. First Minister. Well, we know there is uh, increasing demand for neurodevelopmental support and assessments. We do expect that children should re receive appropriate support as soon as possible. In 2021, we published a national neurodevelopmental specification. It aims to improve the quality of care for children, for young people and their families. The specification itself, as the member may know, outlines seven standards developed with children, developed with families and indeed with key partners for service providers, uh, underpinned by the fact that support should be in place when children need it, rather than dependent on a formal diagnosis. The support is likely to, to be community-based and should be quickly and easily accessible. We continue to work with health boards and local authorities to enhance support for neurodivergent children and young people, including how quickly they can access the support I've already mentioned. We provided over £1 million to support five pilots to implement targeted aspects of the specification. This learning will support wider implementation right across the country. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The First Minister is correct. In September 2021, the Government did set a standard of care. That standard said that children and young people referred for a neurodevelopmental assessment should have an initial appointment no later than four weeks. At that time, my constituent, just 10 years old, had been on the waiting list with NHS Lanarkshire for a year. She is now 13 years old and has been on that waiting list for three and a half years. Three and a half years. First Minister, and she still has no appointment. Her mum told me my daughter has spent a quarter of her life on a waiting list and no one seems to care. First Minister, why does no one care? Why, on your watch as Health Secretary and now First Minister, is that wee girl and countless others having to wait nearly four years just to receive an assessment, never mind any care that she may need? First Minister. Officer, uh, of course, uh, understandably so, Colin uh, Smith hasn't uh, mentioned the name of the individual uh, constituent. Uh, if it is the one that he has written to the Health Secretary about, then we have responded back to Colin Smith. And uh, my officials have been in touch with the Health Board, who say they will be contacting the family uh, imminently. So he has been, uh, been given an update if it is uh, the constituent uh, that I believe it to be. And so we'll continue to work with the Health Board, because I accept fully, without uh, any equivocation, uh, the point that Colin Smith is making, that waiting three and a half, almost four years, is simply uh, not acceptable. So that's why we're providing 
uh, funding to our health service, to our health boards, uh, in relation uh, to tackling some of these issues uh, and, of course, uh, making sure that over the course of the last few years uh, we continue to prioritise mental health uh, funding uh, to record levels under the SNP government. But if he wants further information about his particular constituent case, he's more than welcome to write back uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for Health. But my officials have contacted NHS Lanarkshire uh, and asked for an immediate update. We will suspend briefly. First Minister. I ended uh, also, I think, by saying uh, that uh, my, my office have been in touch, my officials have been in touch with NHS Lanarkshire, and we do hope for this particular family that there will be some progress very soon, and happy to continue to liaise with Colin Smith uh, on this particular constituent case. Karen Adam. Thank you, President Officer. Diagnosis is an important step on the journey when seeking support for the diverse range of conditions that fall under the umbrella of neurodivergence, but many other steps do come after. Can the First Minister provide any further information regarding the steps the Scottish Government is taking to champion the rights of neurodivergent people? First Minister. The Scottish Government is committed to championing the rights of neurodivergent people. I'm very grateful to Karen Adam for raising this issue. Again, she has uh, a track record of raising uh, such uh, issues in this chamber. And we are currently consulting on proposed uh, Learning Disabilities, Autism and Neurodivergence Bill, which will aim to ensure that the rights of neurodivergent people, including autistic people, people with learning disabilities, are respected, are protected and, crucially, are championed. Uh, Karen Adams will be aware, of course, of the consultation, which runs to the 21st of April of this year. Uh, additionally, the Scottish Government and COSLA, supported by Inspiring Scotland, have partnered with people who have experience and stakeholders to establish a new leadership and engagement framework that puts people's voices and experiences firmly at its heart. Rachel Hamilton. Many children coped with the challenges of the pandemic, but those already struggling with mental ill health the impact of lockdowns and lost schooling are likely to have made their condition worse. And shockingly, in the borders, just 40% of young people started CAMS treatment within the 18-week target. To remind the First Minister, his own target is 90% in 18 weeks. First Minister, no more lame excuses. Will your government get to grim grips with this scandalous CAMS crisis now? First again, there's no doubt, of course, about the impact of the pandemic, not just uh, in relation to young people's mental health, as uh, Rachel Hamilton rightly points out, but of course in relation to the demand on our health uh, services. And that's why I referenced in an earlier uh, answer the latest statistics that have come out in relation to CAMS, which of course show that there's room continued for improvement, but we are seeing uh, recovery in our CAMS services and of course continues to show that under this government uh, there, are significant, there is significant investment in CAMS but also in staffing uh, of CAMS. But uh, we also of course are ensuring that there is investment not just in CAMS which is crucial and is vital but also in those pre-crisis inter interventions as well. And that's why we're providing local authorities with £15 million per annum uh, to fund community-based mental health support for children young people and their families. And from local authority reports, in the first half of 2023, more than 58,000 children, young people and their families access community-based mental health support. So we'll continue to invest in our NHS with that uh, record investment of over £19.5 billion, and continue to make progress along that journey of recovery that we're very firmly on. Thank you, First Minister. Um, unfortunately, the opportunity for more elected members to represent their constituents by putting questions to the First Minister has been disrupted once again. I think we would all agree that the principle of this Parliament being open and accessible is extremely important. Visitors are very welcome to attend to see their elected representatives at work, but not to disrupt this work. And again, I would say to colleagues that the Parliament will work with security colleagues and with Police Scotland and will take any further action that is required in this regard. That concludes First Minister's questions and we will now suspend briefly to enable the Chamber and Gallery to leave.
Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Lewis McGlynn. Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Saoirse Healy. Hello and welcome to Broadcasting Scotland. My name is Donald C. Stewart. Broadcasting Scotland is Scotland's independent broadcaster, providing factual news, reporting on the issues important to the people of Scotland. We are committed to public service broadcasting and with your support we will produce even more programmes. We provide opportunities for young people interested in media production and broadcasting and challenge preconceptions of what Scottish media looks like amplifying Scotland's voice and reflecting its communities. We can already deliver high quality live news and we will create the highest quality programmes for you to enjoy but we can only do that with your support. So please subscribe to and share our channel or donate to Broadcasting Scotland via the link in the description. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.